Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate Day 437, Monday, May the 21st, 2017, 2018, I'm sorry, it's 2018. Thank you so much for tuning in. Oh boy, what an extraordinary day Sunday was, huh? In fact, the last week, just unbelievable, the uh, things that are happening and I uh, was just thinking about it this morning. I mean, I don't know if we all realize because we're living in the moment, but a thousand years from now, people are going to read about this particular time in history that we're living through right now. And we're just at the beginning of it. And we're really seeing it uh, play out right now on the domestic side. But this is going to roll out into the entire international global crime syndicate, the New World Order, whatever you want to call it. We are living through a major time in history uh, equal to the, to, to, to the fall of the Roman Empire. Something like that, a, a thousand, two thousand year uh, event in history that will live forever. Long, long after we're all gone from this planet, people will be talking about these things that we're living through right now. Hard to imagine that right now, but I'm looking into the future, into my crystal ball, and I can see what is happening. And it's, we're at the very beginning. With that in mind, <clears throat> let me uh, just tell you that I, I got this morning and I built the page uh, for the timeline. And so I've got the page and I spent about an hour putting in dates and things like that. So I began the process of putting together, putting together this timeline, which we, can, uh, which we can use. The idea is that while you're watching my video, I can put the link for this page so you can open the page. And then uh, as my video is playing, you can be scrolling up and down looking at dates and uh, time frames and things like that on a timeline. Now keep in mind, I've been doing this is video 437. Every day that I do these videos, I have note cards like these. I have a box of over 2,000 of these with dates and times and events. There are two or three other sites I use on the internet with timelines, the Doug Ross timeline for example. So it's a massive amount of stuff. And something else I found out this morning when I started doing this is that every time I put something onto a timeline, unless it's absolutely locked in that we know 100% for sure about that fact, I have to literally fact check each thing before I put it, put it into the timeline. In other words, this is going to be a very grueling process and going to take some time. It could take me a month to do this. But I will get it done and we will have it uh, to work with here in the future. Just be patient. I am working on it. It's a lot. I don't think you realize how many things uh, have happened when you look at them in their totality. But I was is it sitting there going through this massive stack of note cards which I have in a box which are the notes that I use to do my videos and will someday obviously be notes I can refer to uh, if I need to find a particular day, event, or th something to happen. And there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of events, little things. Uh, so I'll be trying to focus as much as possible and narrow it down as much as possible uh, to the things that are really pertinent to what we're talking about. Uh, otherwise, you end up with a timeline that has got so much on it that you, 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 it'll be hard to use because there's so much there. So it's a little tricky and it's very... Uh, uh, laborious and uh, it's gonna it's gonna be somewhat difficult but I will get it done and I'll continue to work on it a little bit every day as much as I can and eventually I will get it done and we'll have it to use so the timeline is underway um, okay let's get to some things here um, <clears throat> okay so Sunday morning we all pretty much woke up to learning that Trump had finally reached his breaking point and announced and tweeted out that he was going to order an investigation into the political surveillance, into the surveillance of his campaign, uh, essentially an espionage campaign against him, and essentially a political witch hunt against him. So he tweeted out on Sunday morning that he was going to launch uh, an order, an investigation, um, into these activities during the election. What does this tell us? Well, this tells us that Trump is fed up and he's tired of sitting back having people tell him not to get involved because it could be politically difficult if he does. 
let the IG let the IG handle it. Let the DOJ handle it. Let Sessions handle it. Let Rodenstein. Yeah, I think he's been hearing this for a long time. But we saw with the IG, the IG was supposed to have his report out in January, then March, then April, now May. And now it looks like it won't be June. Well, what happens in the 1st of June? Well, the Congress takes a two-week vacation for Memorial Day. And then they come back, and now we have about three weeks before they go on summer vacation. So they don't schedule anything or do anything. The summer... In Congress, nothing really happens. And then towards the end of their break, when they come back, they're all campaigning for re-election. They'll schedule nothing else. So in other words, Trump sees and he knows that between now and November, nothing's going to happen. Uh, much is going to happen. Everything grinds to a halt after Labor Day. So um, I think also that he's... We learned about this informant, and I think that after we heard about this informant, Trump probably thought, well, that'll certainly wake Sessions up, and uh, he will now really do something to look into this. But I think he waited a week and not a peep out of Sessions about this, and uh, I think he just blew up. I think he hit his limit. I think he got to the point and said, screw it. Screw the political people telling me what to do. Screw all that. If I don't go out and launch a defense for myself, no one will. So I think he, he launched that for a reason. I think he's just fed up. And I understand that completely. We're all fed up right along with him, and I applaud him. Now, the issue is, is that who does the investigation? Keep in mind, we're in a very extraordinary situation. Normally, the Justice Department would handle an investigation like this, or they would appoint a special counsel. But we already got one special counsel, and how's that going? And where were the crimes committed? Right in the belly of the beast, the Department of Justice and the FBI. So who are you going to get to investigate them? The Department of Justice to investigate itself? I think we've all seen how that's worked out. And here we have um, uh, what's going on with the IG. And so what happens later in the evening, at about 6 o'clock in the evening, uh, Rodenstein, for some strange reason, comes out and says, oh yeah, we heard what the President said, and we've already ordered the Justice Department to tell the IG to go ahead and add this onto his list of things to look into. But the IG has doesn't have the ability to prosecute anybody. Mr. Huber does, but who has Mr. Huber prosecuted? McCabe was found guilty of lying to the FBI and the DOJ four times, and he was lying about the fact that he had two or three people working under him who he ordered to write articles to post into the Wall Street Journal uh, about a personal matter. Massive crimes. Way worse than what Flynn and Papagalopoulos did, but yet they were charged and indicted. So, we know this about McCabe. The IG puts out his report. Has anybody heard of Mr. Huber filing charges? Been plenty of time for him to file charges on McCabe, but no. We heard, we've heard nothing. McCabe's apparently doing fine. No charges against him for lying four times and, and using his office to engage in something he definitely should not be involved in. Violation of policy. Uh, I don't know about violation of the law, but it's a violation of FBI policy. Uh, so we aren't really seeing any action. We aren't really seeing any action. Trump isn't seeing any action. He's just, You think you're frustrated? Imagine if you're President Trump. How frustrated would you be? You're the most powerful man in the world, and you're just, you know, you're just, you're just, you're taking a thousand arrows a day, and you're not allowed to defend yourself. You're not allowed to defend yourself. That would be politically uh, hard. That would be, I would give the media fodder. It would give the left wing fodder. And this is what he's been told. And I think he's taking off the gloves. He's fed up. He's hit the boiling point, and he's going to take control of the situation because apparently Sessions. Again, it's not a personal attack against Sessions. I don't, I don't hate Sessions. I, I, don't, I don't think he's part of some gigantic conspiracy or anything like that. I, I have no explanation for why Sessions just does not act. Again, it's not personal against Sessions, but you know, we find out that there's this informant. Sessions should have responded to that, but he, he, he didn't. He hasn't. It's unbelievable. But now to so Rodenstein comes out and says, oh, well, we've told the IG that they're going to have to go ahead and investigate this. No, this is not for the IG to investigate. Mr. Huber does not have the powers that Mueller has. No, we need a group of people outside the Department of Justice completely, a group of prosecutors who can look at the CIA, who can look at all these other things that happened. If it's just the DOJ uh, and the FBI, what about all the other things that happened? They were happening, uh, you know, back in the fall of 2015. Mike Rogers can tell them that. So I was really surprised to see Rodenstein come out and make that statement. And I would not be the least bit surprised tomorrow to have Trump come out and say, Rodenstein, 
What do you mean, Rodenstein? Telling the IG that just add this onto your list of uh, bucket list, uh, uh, Mr. Horowitz. Uh, look into this too. I don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> and I think that Trump's probably going to call Rodenstein out and say, "Look, Rodenstein shouldn't be running any damn thing." He issued one of the FISA warrants. He's been blocking Congress from getting documents. He's been doing everything he can to obstruct any investigation into getting to the bottom of what's going on at the DOJ. Why the hell will we count on him to be the guy to run another operation against the DOJ? Which will do what? Drag it out, drag it out until, you know, past election time, by which time Uncle Bob has already dropped his report, which says that Trump engaged in this and this or that or this and that which will be fodder for the 2018 elections. It's not going to work, but it's all they got. So, <clears throat> um, so I just think that Trump's fed up with all of it, and I really doubt seriously if he's going to, regardless of what Rodenstein said about having the IG pick up, add this to his list of things, I don't think uh, that, uh, that Trump's going to go for that. I think he's thinking about something completely different that does not involve Rodenstein, who's one of the people that should be targeted for investigation. He should have recused himself a long time ago with the conflict of interests he has. You can't count on Rodenstein. And Trump knows that. We'll wait and see how Trump responds tomorrow. But no question, this tells me Trump is taking off the gloves. He's not going to listen to his political people anymore. He is going to take action. He's going to take control of the situation. And he's going to bust some asses. That's what that tells you. He's going after these people. That's what that tells you. So, that's my thoughts on that. We'll see what happens on Monday as this situation develops. Now, we also have the European Union in freakout mode. So, they met a couple days ago to come up with a plan that will keep uh, them, that will insulate them from being sanctioned by the U.S. for dealing with Iran because they have every intention of continuing their dealings with Iran. If you want to take down Iran, you have to have these tough sanctions on them, which is what you need because right now the protests in Iran are growing larger and larger and larger. A protest started there about four days ago. They tried to put it down. The next day it came back larger. They put it down again. It came back the next day larger. The, the, as I predicted to you, uh, the only thing that they need in Iran right now is for everybody to get on board hardcore sanctions. In 90 days, the people of Iran will take their damn country back. That's how close we are. But it's not happening because the Europeans are feeding the Iranians. And in order for the sanctions to work, they have to participate. So what happens? Trump comes out and says, okay, we are going to have these hardcore sanctions, Iran. We're going to bring them to their knees. They're this close to being toppled over, and we can push them over with a feather. All we need is about three months of hardcore sanctions. But that means the Europeans, for once in their life, have to play ball and live up to these sanctions instead of cheating. So when the Iranians heard that, knowing exactly that that's the truth, uh, they came out and, and made a threat uh, that said, okay, to the European Union, if you and all the Western countries do not find a way to stop Trump from penalizing you from doing business with us, then we're going to drop the names of all the Western leaders who got money, got bribes, as part of the Iran deal. So, so they're threatening to out the people who took bribes during the Iran deal if, in fact, they go along with the sanctions or if, in fact, they do not find a way to um, avoid the sanctions because we can penalize them. They don't have anything to say about it. We do it through the international banking system, which we control. <laughs> That's right. We can penalize them through the international banking system, and they can't do a damn thing about it. We own SWIFT. And all these European countries that do business with Iran and do all the transfers of payments do it through SWIFT. We can stop it. We can stop it. So the European Union, they understand this, so they got together a couple days ago to try to come up with a plan for how they can continue to do business with Iran and ignore Trump's demand that they participate seriously in the sanctions. And these Europeans are nuts. If they would pay attention to what's going on in Iran, they would see that that situation is critical. It's right on the edge. All they need is just a little push, a couple of months of really hard sanctions, and it would be over. The Iranian people would take that country back. The mullahs would flee, and you would have literally a real revolution in Iran. Then we need to stay out of it and let those people pick the type of leader they want. And they'll do well. The Iranian people, the Persian people, they're, they're smart people. They want freedom. 
they want to maintain their culture. They do not want to buy into the new world order. Uh, they do not want to have their country turned into like France and all these other countries. They want to control their borders. They want to control their culture and all that. They just want to live in a free society. They want to have some prosperity. They want to have the opportunity to get a job, to raise a family, to live their lives uh, uh, without being under the thumb of the, of the mullahs who are making them miserable and very unhappy and very poor, by the way. So uh, that's the deal there. We'll keep watching the European situation. I don't know what they can do. We control SWIFT. They make a transaction, we can kill it. And we can sanction them. And Trump will do it. And that's what the Europeans know. Obama wouldn't. Uh, Clinton wouldn't. Uh, Bush wouldn't. Trump will. And they know it. Let's keep our eye on that. Remember, we're talking about Trump is not just battling a swamp in D.C. This is an international crime syndicate. International crime syndicate that he is taking on. Nearly impossible task. It's David versus Goliath. That's David versus Godzilla. I mean, unbelievable. Times that we are living through. We'll watch as these things play out. We now know for sure, I asked the question and I said, as soon as we prove, and we know we will, that, that Mr. Halper was involved long before July the 31st of 2016. Because the FBI is on record. They're on record as saying that they officially began the counterintelligence operation on July 31st, 2016. What that means is if there was any activities going on before that, especially a spy or an informant or an asset or a mole or whatever you want to call it, implanted into the campaign or doing things um, prior to that, anything that they did prior to that, uh, is illegal. Well, of course, everything they were doing after that was illegal too because of the reason they were doing it and what they were doing. But I'm saying it blows them out of the water because they've now established July 28th, or July 31st actually, of 2016 as being the date the official operation started, the, the uh, investigation. So anything that they did before that is done, it's unwarranted, it's unjustified, done without probable cause, done without any order, any directive, anything. In other words, it was not legal. And I said, as soon as someone proves, and we already know, just from things we've gone over here, that Halper was involved long before July the 28th, uh, July 31st, uh, 2016, as well as uh, Mr. Downer, uh, Papaglopoulos, whoever else was involved, uh, Mr. Brennan, the private contact was accessing the database, all these events, many, many events have been going on long before July 31st, 2016. So we now know for absolutely positively sure, because Carter Page just recently did an interview and he said that he met, he was, he met with and attended this function in Cambridge, England and London on July the 22nd. July the 22nd, that would be nine days before the counterintelligence operation began. So now we know. Halper was there doing things, and he was there doing things long before that, uh, at least nine days before they officially began the operation, which means they're caught in another big, fat lie. And that's the beginning of the untangling and the beginning of the end for them. And Mr. Halper, who's probably, uh, I would suggest, as I said in an earlier post, Mr. Halper not... Uh, get on his roof to clean his gutters or do anything like that. He should avoid power tools. He should definitely not drive in a Mercedes, especially uh, one, the model that Michael Hastings was driving. Uh, he definitely should not be taking any medication. He should stop any taking of medication. He should avoid hammers, forks, solid objects, blunt force objects. Uh, he should avoid everything. He should lock his doors, go down in his basement, sit in a hole, and listen to the radio. And that might not even work. But he's definitely gone underground and the secretary has disconnected the phone. As you know, I've been looking into the deeper roots of Papagalopoulos to find out what's going on with this dude. Because we don't have the whole story on Papagalopoulos. And of course we know who brought him into the campaign. It was Mr. Sam Clovis. Now Mr. Clovis was the assistant director of the Trump campaign. He was the number two guy at the head of the Trump campaign. And once Trump won the election, he briefly uh, was given a job, I think, in the agriculture department. But he was only able to serve there for a few weeks, and he was forced to 
resign or be fired or whatever. He left. And that's because uh, Papagalopoulos, by that point, had been interviewed by the FBI and was found to have lied or had or was had some issues. And because it was Mr. Clovis who brought him in and he was questioned by the FBI, uh, I guess people around Trump said, you know, we got this stuff going on over here. We got Clovis, you know, and now he's being investigated. He's, it's, it's, we don't need it. I, I think it's best if Clovis go. He's the guy who brought in Papagalopoulos. A lot of questions. Let's just cut ties. So that was the end of Mr. Clovis, and he disappeared. We never heard from him. So I've been looking into Mr. Clovis. As you know, I did a deep dive into his bio. But I've just learned that in the summer of 2016, don't know what month of the summer, but sometime in 2016, Mr. Halper, and this was in the U.S., in Virginia, Mr. Halper went and paid at least one visit to Mr. Clovis and told Mr. Clovis, hey, you know, I would love to offer my assistance on foreign policy to the campaign. At which point Mr. Clovis said, oh, well, great, Mr. Halper. Uh, you're a, gosh, you're an old pro. We'd be, we'd be blessed and honored to have someone of your uh, 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 level of experience and talent and skill to come in under the Trump campaign. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea. So apparently it was Mr. Clovis back in the summer of 2016 who gave Mr. Halper the thumbs up to do some foreign policy related things. And I think that, that we're going to find out when we get to the bottom of this that one of the very first things that Mr. Halper did as part of this, uh, you know, even though he was never brought in an official or even unofficial position uh, into the Trump campaign, I think we're going to learn that one of the things that Mr. Clo that Mr. Uh, Halper did was as part of his helping with uh, foreign policy was he was he uh, drafted Papagalopoulos to bring him into the game, you might say, and it was probably the only thing that he had any interest in doing as part of the Trump campaign. So he just needed some kind of a, some kind of a uh, something, a thumbs up, a wink of the eye, something from Mr. Clovis, so that now he would have the uh, uh, somewhat, I would say, authority, but somewhat the okay to go to talk to people like Papagalopoulos or Carter Page and say, yeah, well, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of an advisor too to the Trump campaign. I spoke with Mr. Clovis, and uh, yeah, he's welcomed my services, and that's probably how he was able to. Uh, introduce himself to Papagalopoulos and Page and get involved is because Mr. Clovis, back in the summer of 2016, at a conversation at Mr. Clovis's home with Mr. Halper, they decided that Mr. Halper could offer some assistance. Oh, yes. I think we're digging deeper into Mr. Halper and learning that he was involved in a lot more than just what we've known so far. We're going to find out that Mr. Halper was deeply involved in a lot of things going way back before July 22nd, 2016. Federal records now show that Mr. Halper was paid $411,000 during 2016 and 2017. He appar apparently, uh, so let's see here. That's according to Jeff Carlson at Market Watch, uh, who does a great job, uh, or, in, uh, or marketsworkcom uh, and also Jacob Wall. So we know that he was paid 283000 in 2016 and another 129000 in 2017. And he was being paid allegedly under the title of Research and Development in the Social Sciences and Humanities. <laughs> and guess who was paying him? He was being paid by an agency of the government. And that agency was the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense was the ones who uh, paid Mr. Halper uh, $411,000 from uh, late spring of 2016 on up until 2017. And as far as we know, he might still be getting paid. And who? Uh, and what? Uh, in that massive bureaucracy known as the Department of Defense, there's probably thousands of different many bureaucracies within the Department of Defense, and I was able to find out that the actual little agency within the Department of Defense that actually uh, contracted Mr. Halper to do this uh, research development in the social sciences and humanities, turns out it's a little bureaucracy inside the DOD known as the Washington Headquarters Services. Washington Headquarters Services, and they are headed up by a woman named Barbara Westgate. So I did some looking into Barbara Westgate. She is a member of the Senior Executive Service, 
When do you think Mrs. Westgate uh, assumed her position as head of the Washington Headquarters Services of the DOD? April 18th, 2016, right when all of this was beginning. Mid-April of 2016, Barbara Westgate, the Senior Executive Service member, head of Washington Headquarters Services, part of the DOD, the one who approved and signed off on the checks to Mr. Halper, took her position April 18th, 2016. Do you know what she was known for before that? Just prior to that, she had done a major thesis, a major writing on the Battle of Britain. Do you think that she went over to England to, the, to do research, to do her paper for the Battle uh, of Britain? And who is it that keeps those kind of records? Well, I don't know with the, with the British government, but here in the United States, those type of records are kept by the CIA. Oh yes, you didn't know that? Oh yeah, the CIA maintains the US government's history division. They have thousands of people at the CIA that do nothing more than document thousands and thousands of bits of information day by day that go into a gigantic database that will become later the history, the part of our history. They also go back and they review previous things in history and make corrections as new information comes along. The CIA has a history division I imagine that the GCHQ or British Intelligence MI6 have the same basic setup. Very interesting, don't you think? The dishonorable James Comey has gone dark as well. Since his last, or his last Facebook post was the 10th of May the day before we learned about the informant. Since we've learned about the informant, Comey has gone silent on his social media. Hmm, that's interesting, don't you think? Dumbass of the week. Well, man oh man, I wanted to give it to Glenn Beck so bad I could taste it. He really deserves it. Never liked that guy from day one. My sister, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, told me one day, she says, Oh, have you ever heard of Glenn Beck? Oh, you got to listen to Glenn Beck. He's great. Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck, Glenn Beck. I listened to the guy for like half an hour, like 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and uh, before he even had his Fox show, uh, when he was just on radio. And uh, I listened about half an hour and thought, this guy's, this guy, this guy, I'm not buying it, man. No way. So my, my sister's kind of a neocon. She loved Bush, still probably loves, well, she don't love Bush anymore, but she still just thinks he was inept. Uh, you know, she at least accepts he's inept now. Before she used to think he was great. But now at least I've convinced her and she's learned from history that she was wrong on Bush. So she's kind of a neocon, kind of a Christian, hardcore Christian neo, neoconservative. My sister, wonderful girl, finest person you ever meet in your life, do anything for you. But she's kind of a sucker. Uh, you know, she kind of falls for people like that. You know, if they if they say Jesus t twice a day and they, you know, have a Bible, uh, they got to be good. She could never understand how anyone could be religious and be evil. Uh, she doesn't understand deception, which is how the New World Order crowd like the Bushes function, through deception. I explained that to her many times. She did not like to accept that she would get mad and turn around and huff and puff and walk away. Now she understands. I've been vindicated with Big Sis. Now, let's get to the dumbass of the week. It was suggested by one of my subs in the comment section it should definitely be hands down Clapper. And again, uh, the fact that Glenn Beck has just uh, jumped onto the Trump train, <laughs> uh, I thought would be the ideal dumbass of the week because he's deserved it for so many reasons for so long. But I'm going to go with my sub here and go ahead and give it to Clapper because quite honestly, that interview he gave on CNN on Thursday night was absolutely insane. It was insane. <laughs> he goes on CNN on Thursday night and he says that it was actually a good thing uh, that the FBI had that informant, uh, someone in the, in the campaign to communicate with us, he said. 
essentially uh, stating that this informant, that this essentially is no doubt now, because you got Clapper on Thursday night saying, yes, yeah, a good thing we had an informant to communicate with us. Okay, so he's all in now. He's all in now. There's no denying it for James Clapper. Uh, the unwitting idiot has just, whether he knows it or not, just has just locked himself in with the informant and with the communication with the informant. And of course, uh, this informant's actually an agent provocateur, and he's not an informant at all. And he says it's a good thing that the uh, agent provocateur was spying on Trump on his campaign, because they were actually protecting Trump. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? You gotta be a complete effing moron to buy that. Clapper is, clearly, these people believe that we're all really, really naive and stupid. That's what they believe. I swear to you, man. These people, I've met people like this, dude. I'm telling you, these elites, they believe they are really, really special uh, intellects and that, and that all the rest of us are just dumb fools who go into a factory every day and push a button and watch a machine or do this or do that. They don't think that we have any intelligence whatsoever or ability to figure anything out. They really don't. They have no respect for our intellectual uh, capabilities or anything else. They really think we're stupid when in fact it's them. They are the ones who are really stupid. In fact, when I watch people like Clapper and uh, Brennan and uh, all these people, Pelosi and Maxine Waters, you watch these people, <clears throat> man, these are really stupid people. It's not a joke. These are for real people. They really are what you see. They really are that bad and that stupid. And that's why they're being hung with their own petard. So anyway, dumbass of the week, the unwitting idiot James Clapper, who apparently let Brennan talk him into going along with this, and uh, and uh, I don't know if he initiated something like this, but he certainly let himself be talked into going along with it, and now he is up a creek. And I believe that all this started before Brennan passed that information over to the FBI. But at this point, uh, I think uh, Brennan is certainly going to be one of the key scapegoats. I think Clapper could be right along with him. Uh, we'll find out. But I think the entire cabal is about to go down now because Trump has taken matters into his own hands. And things are about to get really, really ugly now. Uh, definitely tighten up them uh, seatbelts. Prepare for heavy, heavy turbulence because now Trump is just, you know, he's not playing the game anymore. Things are going to get very, very rough over the next and we're all going to love it of course it's great for us but trump's going to be taking on the world man <laughs> he's going to be taking on the world swamp the global swamp and it's going to be very difficult um but uh we just have to keep supporting him and keep fighting doing everything that we can do that's all we can do um so monday is going to be a very interesting day to see how trump responds to rodenstein telling him that, yeah well let the ig handle this i'm pretty sure trump's not going to go for that I'm pretty sure that he's going to call Rodenstein out. He should just call him into his office and fire his ass. In fact, a lot of people are making are suggesting that the reason Trump did this is to see if he could force Sessions and or Rodenstein to quit by saying, hey, I want you to appoint someone to investigate this and see if they would reject it and maybe resign. So maybe it was a move by Trump, a power play, to see if he could force Sessions and Rodenstein to resign so he doesn't have to fire them. But I wouldn't be surprised if this week is a week of real turmoil, real turmoil. A lot of things are, are crossing, a lot of swords being crossed this week. And it'll be, we have to watch very closely. It's going to be a very wild week, uh, especially leading up to a holiday like this. So anyway, we'll keep watching. But there's one last thing. Um, you know, I made a comment about two weeks ago that, that this thing is eventually going to come full circle back to those servers. And Mora, uh, the lovely and talented Mora, who keeps our swamp creature list uh, up to date, she commented on my comment and said, yeah, and it actually goes back before that to Seth Rich. Very astute, Mora. Well done. Very nicely done. Because I'm thinking about that now. Now that Trump's up the game, and he really is going to get to the bottom of this. He's going to... He's going to create a shitstorm and it is going to get deep into this and now I'm wondering like Mora said we go all the way back around full circle to the very beginning it all actually does start with Seth Rich
That's right. Because there was no Russians hacking the DNC. Seth Rich leaked that stuff. If we get all the way back to it and we really get to the truth, that is what we're going to learn. How crazy could it get? <laughs> Roll that around in your head for a little while. See where that takes you. Thanks for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow. Because of a good night. Buckle up.